Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another review of Love After Lockup Season 3, Episode 2, Bad at Being Good. So we're starting off with Scott and Lindsay. Now, um, Lindsay is about to be released and the plan is for Scott to go pick up Lindsay's mother and Lindsay's 10 year old daughter and they're all gonna drive to go pick her up from prison. Now, it starts off with Scott packing up, I guess, a bag for Lindsay, um, getting her clothes ready and everything, and he shows us the underwear that he bought for her, and I thought that was a little bit unnecessary, but let's move past that. So I forgot to mention in my previous video that Scott is financially supporting Lindsay's mom and daughter. So he's been taking care of them. And I don't know what that all entails. I'm not sure exactly how often he visits them, how close they live to one another. I don't really know. But I guess he's at least sends them money. He helps them out financially. And Lindsay's been incarcerated for four years and her daughter's 10. So from the age of six to 10, her daughter's been without her mom. And you know, when they bring the children into this and we get to see how these adults' decisions are affecting the children, it kind of makes it all real. It's like, well, it's not fun and games anymore. You know, just like a little, you know, a show where you just kind of gossip and laugh at these people. There are children involved whose lives are being affected. And it was really sad to see that, you know, her mom has been gone for a good part of her life. And her grandmother, I don't know if her, the grandmother of the little girl, Lindsay's mom, I don't know if she's married or not, but you know, I'm pretty sure it wasn't easy for her to raise this little girl by herself while her mom's been away in prison I know, for the past four years. And I'm pretty sure that when Scott came into the picture and was helping out financially, um, it meant a lot to her mom and it meant a lot to Lindsay. And Scott also reveals to us that he had a 20 year old son that died suddenly in a tragic car accident. And that was sad, you know, so him talking about his son losing his son so tragically and so suddenly and the little girl being interviewed and you know you see how excited she is about her mother coming home and you know now we know that you know the decisions that Lindsay makes and has made is affecting you know so many people it kind of like it was a little bit emotional I'm not gonna say emotional I don't know these people in real life but you know it kind of made you think like wow you know this is real life stuff there's real stuff going on here and um, I just hope and pray that Lindsay has really gotten her act together and that um, she's not playing games with her life anymore and not playing games with Scott I'm not saying that Lindsay needs to she has to be with him but I hope that she's gonna whatever happens between her and Scott I hope that she treats them with some compassion that's all I'm saying whatever happens I hope that she treats them with some compassion because it must be really difficult for him to lose his son like that I don't know how long ago it happened but it must be really difficult and they showed pictures of him and everything and it was really sad you know to think about this man how he lost his son because it seemed like you know he was close with his child and all of a sudden you know just taken away from him in the blink of an eye so you just kind of hope that Lindsay isn't really using him or, you know, scamming him or whatever. And that whatever happens, you know, she does it with some type of humanity. And um, what led her to prison was her addiction to meth. She became addicted to meth and she started selling drugs to support her habit. And that's what landed her in prison. And I hope that, you know, she was able to get some type of... Uh, drug addiction assistance, some type of recovery assistance in prison. And if not, I really hope that she gets it when she's out and that she takes it really, really seriously and, you know, changes her life for the better for her kid, for herself as well. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, the, the title of the episode is uh, Good at Being Bad or Bad at Being Good. Because uh, this is a quote that came from Lindsay herself when she was explaining that while she was in prison, in a span of about seven months, she had eight incidents. And so she she violated or did got in trouble eight times in seven months. And so it kind of makes you wonder, you know, is she really, has she really turned you know, turn for the better. I really hope she has. She's got a little girl that's depending on her. Um, and she has a man that's really in love with her and wants to marry her. 
And so she's, I hope that, I just hope that Lindsay has gotten herself together because it's going to be really sad if she hasn't. Moving on to uh, Christiana and John. Now, Christiana, she's the one that's been in prison uh, for burglary. She's been in and out of prison for the past 14 years of her life for burglary. She also has a drug addiction, and her drug addiction led her to committing burglaries. John um, is also the ex-felon as well. He doesn't have a drug issue as far as I can tell, but he's definitely an ex-felon. So um, I had said previously that hopefully because of his history, um, he would be able to, you know, help her out and he can be someone for her to depend on that he's a little bit more understanding on what it's like to serve time and to come out and to try to get your life together and because of his experience with that he'd have the patience you know to kind of guide her in the right direction now he is the one that has built with his own two hands he has built a makeshift altar because his plan is when he goes to pick up christiana is to propose to her and marry her right on the spot he is not playing games so he has a whole entire chauffeur to drive him to prison and i think his family are coming after or right behind him with the whole uh makeshift altar so i hope that she's ready now he did say that christiana has told him in the past i love you but i'm not in love with you because they haven't had a physical relationship i think the whole time that they've been dating it's been through prison walls um they've they've never i, I want to say he said that he had never seen her that they've never had met in real life everything was has been through i guess whatever however they communicate um with him being on the outside and her being on the inside but they've never had a physical relationship and so this is the reason why she's like you know i love you but i'm not in love with you so that makes me wonder john why are you proposing to a woman that has said to you you know point blank that she's not in love with you why would you marry a woman? Because to say I love you but not in love with you, I mean, it could mean I just love you for really being a good friend to me. I love you for really being there for me. And she probably has no type of romantic inclinations or intentions whatsoever. But we'll see how that works out. So what we see in this episode is her coming out of prison with a little box of stuff. And she walks up to him. He's waiting for her by the limo. The limo driver is also waiting outside. And um, I bet this is the kind of <laughs> the kind of fare that the limo driver has never experienced before. Um, it'll be a story to tell for him. So she walks up to him, and as soon as they hug and everything, he gets down on one knee, pulls out that little box, and proposes to her. And so that ends there we don't know what she's going to say until next week so that's going to be really interesting to see what she says we'll see you next week and then after that we have maurice and jessica so maurice is the compton crip and jessica lives in las vegas she is, uh, she says some interesting things in this episode. She did mention that before they met, um, Maurice was dating someone else who had basically, you know, was financially supporting him while he was in prison. And she said that this other woman, his ex-girlfriend, had given him a lot of money. But then for whatever reason, they broke up and then he met Jessica and they got married. I think she kind of made it seem like they got married kind of right away. So her whole thing is, you know, I hope that, you know, he wasn't marrying me for the wrong reason. Because obviously the only way for a prisoner to have conjugal visits is to be married. And so in this episode, she kind of questioned, you know, is my whole marriage a sham? You know, like he just married me just so he could have conjugal visits. Well, when he's released, she is waiting for him. She's really excited. She's nervous out of her mind. She's so nervous. And she has on a, you know, you know, like a cute, short, tight little dress. And, you know, the kind of dress, you know, like, you know, my man's getting out of prison. And we're about to get it on as soon as he gets out kind of dress. So... You know, we know what's going to happen there. So as soon as he comes out, you know, he gives her a great big hug. You know, it's a sweet reunion. And they just can't wait to jump each other's bones. That's where we're going with Jessica and Maurice. And 
Let me see if there's anything else to say about them. Oh, she also said in this episode that um, they've been married for four years, but they had not seen each other for the past two years because she said, this, these are her words, that they said he was bringing drugs into the prison. Kind of like, you know, like she believes he might, he, might, he might not have been guilty of that. You know, they said he was doing this. Most likely he was. So she said that because he was bringing drugs bringing drugs into the prison his visitation privileges were revoked for the for two years and so even though they're married she hasn't seen him in two years so you know i'm pretty sure that that's that was a very exciting reunion for them then we go to quaylen and chevelle so quaylen and chevelle both live in kansas city missouri quaylen quaylen's mom quilandria Excuse me, y'all. Quilandria lives in Houston, Texas. She used to live in Missouri, in Kansas City, but she had to. But she ended up moving to Houston because I guess it was just the wrong element in Missouri, and um, so she moved to Houston for a better life. So Chevelle has to go pick up the mom. The mom went to Missouri to meet with Chevelle so they can both drive to the prison together to uh, get Quaylen. Now. Chevelle has been nervous about meeting Quaylen's mom because I guess from what she's heard from Quaylen, um, the mother is pretty like a very strong, opinionated woman. And so this kind of intimidated Chevelle, I guess. But when they initially met, everything was fine. You know, they seemed really warm with each other. But everything kind of fell apart when she, when they were driving to the prison. So on their way to the prison, evidently they both had different expectations of where Quaylen was gonna live. Quaylen told his mom he's going to move to Houston with her. And Quaylen told Chevelle he's going to stay in Missouri with her. So the two women were kind of bickering about that because, you know, they were like, well, he told me this. Well, he told me that. And so, you know, Chevelle is like, well, he's a grown man. He can make his own decision. And the mom is like, no, he's not staying here because this is where he got in trouble. This is where it all fell apart here in Missouri. So he's going to come back to Texas with me because as soon as I tell him we're going to Texas, we're going to Texas, both me and Quaylen. So the mom kind of made it seem like there's no discussion about it. There's no debate about it. There's no thoughts about it. He's coming back to Texas with her. And Chevelle is kind of like, mm, well, we'll see about that. Now, Chevelle has a little girl. Here we go with the kids. She has a little girl. I think she's about five years old. And um, as I said before, if Quaylen is serious about being with Chevelle, he went into prison at the age of 17. He's coming out at the age of 29. So he completely went from boy to man behind bars. Now you're going from boy to man behind bars. Now you're going from single man to ready-made father as soon as you walk out of those prison walls because you're going to be with a woman who has a little girl, a very impressionable little girl. So I'm just like, wow, <laughs> that's, that's a lot. I think I said that in my previous video. That's a lot. That's a lot for him. I'm, ho I'm thinking and I'm hoping that Chevelle and Quaylen will take it slow and not just rush into this like 100% committed, serious, in-depth relationship where he's living with her and all of this because it's just a lot for the child and it's a lot for Chevelle, I mean for Quaylen. Now, of course, Chevelle has gotten her daughter ready for Quaylen's um, coming home and I'm pretty sure the girl has probably talked to him through FaceTime or whatever. So it's not a complete stranger that's coming into her life, but still, um, Chevelle to me seems like it's kind of hyped up Quaylen for her little girl, for her to get excited about him. I just hope that if that's the case, then Quaylen, I hope you don't disappoint. You don't disappoint these people. Now, Chevelle had said that she had been in a lot of relationships, but all the men end up using her and Quaylen was the first one to not use her. And I'm like, well, how can he? Because, I mean, he can use you for money, I guess, but how can he use you any other way? He's behind bars. You know, these people who want to date people who are incarcerated, I just don't understand how you can judge anything about the relationship or even about that person when you're dealing in a, in a situation where someone has no freedom at all you know because we would all be completely different people if our freedom was taken away from us 
I don't think that the person behind bars is really the person that you're gonna, that's gonna, that, that that's not gonna be the person once they're released. So she said, well, he's not using me. So I don't know how you can judge whether or not Quaylen is better than your past relationships, your past boyfriends, because you haven't really seen the real Quaylen. Y'all have limited communication, limited time with each other, and he's can't live a normal life. So you don't know whether or not this is better than you. Anyways, girl, okay, whatever. So she says that what sealed the deal for her, what let her know that Quaylen was the one, was when he gave her daughter a birthday card. That's when she knew he was the one, just on that gesture alone. And I just wanna tell Chevelle, Chevelle, you don't know whether he's the one or not until he is out of prison. Prisoners have a lot of time to send cards and letters and, you know, they're always there when you need to talk to them or whatever the situation is. You know, they don't have an opportunity to not be around. You know, <laughs> they don't have the opportunity to forget birthdays. I mean, they don't have the opportunity to do that. So I don't think you should judge that he's the one for you just because he gave your little girl a birthday card. It takes a lot more than that but I'm just fascinated by the fact that quaylen has been gone from 17 to 29 and I just can't wait to see how he gets acclimated to the free world after being gone for so long not just being gone for so long but going through such a major transformation in yourself you know behind bars it's not like he was it wasn't like from 30 to 42 it was from 17. I can't believe that they sent him to big boy prison at the age of 17. I guess, you know, in some states that is considered a full grown man. Then we go to Destiny and Sean. Destiny and Sean. So they've never met in person. Uh, she's been gone. I don't know how long she's been gone. They met through a pen pal prison website. Sean is the guy who's got the six children and the baby mama or the mother of his child. I can't call. They were never married. They're all, they have an on, on again, off again type of relationship. But I guess now it's permanently off. And um, they have six kids together. So I don't want to say baby mama, but he has a an, an ex-girlfriend, I guess. Okay. So, and he's also the one that had taken money out of his 401k, his savings, all kinds of stuff to try to uh, support her and also pay for her bond and, you know, trying to help her get out. So, in this scene, in this episode, Sean is telling his ex-girlfriend that, and I say, when I say ex-girlfriend, I feel like that doesn't give it enough weight. I mean, y'all have... They've been together for 22 years on and off and they have six children together so it's kind of like to say ex-girlfriend really doesn't paint the picture of what this woman is and her name is kelly what kelly is to sean's life but i can't say ex-wife because they were not married i don't even know if they were common law married so i don't even know okay so let's just say his ex-girlfriend so he is telling his ex-girlfriend that or the mother of his children that they're at a store shopping for the for their for their daughter their 16 year old daughter and he breaks the news to his ex-girlfriend that you know destiny is coming out soon and she's going to be living with me and i plan on marrying her and so kelly does not take it well at all she does not take it well she's like I don't, you don't even know this woman. You don't know if you're being catfished. You don't even know if she's a real woman. And he's like, I do know she's a real woman. I'm not being catfished. This is the woman that I want to be with. And she says, well, she's not coming around my kids until I've met her, until I've given the seal of approval of whether or not she can come around our children. So she's not taking it very well at all. And also, she also says to him, you know, how can you marry her in such a short period of time when you've never married me after 22 years of being together and six kids you know but she could never you know i wasn't good enough to marry you know what's up with that and of course he had nothing to say but i want to know sean what's up with that okay you've given this woman 22 years of your life y'all have this whole entire family together but you could never marry her but you want to marry someone who is incarcerated you're going to take your chance on a woman who you don't really know because you really don't know people 
when they're in prison. They don't have the chance to be the real them until they're out. Anyways, so you're going to take your take your chance on a woman who you've never met in person. You met her through some website, some pen pal website. You don't really know her. Okay, no matter how many letters you've written to each other, or how many phone calls I've had, you don't really know this woman. You're going to take a chance on her, bring her around your kids, but you wouldn't take a chance on a woman who stood by your side for 22 years and gave you six beautiful babies. I have questions, Sean, and I hope you got some answers. So Kelly is upset about this whole situation. And so he she tells him, well, you're going to have to break this to your daughter. You're going to have to tell her yourself what you plan to do. And y'all, it was really sad. It was so sad. So he tells his daughter, she's 16 years old. He pulls her to the side and he says, you know, that girl that I've been seeing, Destiny, and you know, the girl, the daughter's familiar with her. And he tells her, well, she's coming out of prison and... She's coming to live with me. And the little girl didn't take it well. She did not take it well. She started crying. You know, she said, so basically you're gonna push us to the side to start a whole new family. And no matter what he said to convince her that that's not what's, do that's not what's happening, Sean, that is what's happening. That is what's happening. That's how the child sees it. That's how your daughter sees it. No matter what you do or what you say, that's how she's going to see it. So you're going to have to really, really work extra hard to let your children know that they are still number one. They are still your priority over your girlfriend. And that you are not, I mean, if if this relationship does take off and they have a kid together, I'm pretty sure that's not going to go well either. But Sean, you need to really let your kids know that you are not pushing them to the side to make room for this, you know, this new woman in your life. Um, he's going to have to work extra hard, extra, extra hard. This is not going to be easy because Kelly didn't take it well. His daughter didn't take it well. I don't even know how you can go on. I, I mean, how can you continue on with this plan knowing how it's affecting your family you know but you know i guess he has to move on he has to live his life but the whole thing of her being in prison and, and then the little girl i keep saying little girl she's 16 this his 16 year old daughter asks him what was she in prison for and he said for drugs and his daughter says you know dad that's that's really big so We'll see how that goes. That was really sad. Really, really sad. When they bring the babies into these shows and you see how it's affecting the kids. It's really heartbreaking. But that's all I got. It went on too long again. But thank you for joining me. Um, if you like what you see, give me a like, subscribe, all that good jazz. If you didn't like what you see, well, I tried. And I guess you'll never come back again, but thanks for stopping by and I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.